All right, the meeting has started recording, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for our discussion of accessory dwelling units in Tacoma Park, a discussion about design um, and permitting. My name is Rebecca Ballow. I am the supervisor for the Historic Preservation Section with Montgomery Planning. We are joined this evening by my colleagues Dan Bruckert, Cultural Resources Planner with the HP team, Lisa Gavoni, Housing Planner with our CPP division, and Alexander Friedman with the City of Tacoma Park. Um, there are other folks joining joining us this evening from the City of Tacoma Park from their um, permitting um, and development divisions who are also available for questions. So I'd like to kick it off this evening um, with Lisa's portion of the presentation. So I will be sharing out her PowerPoint. Make sure I do this correctly and then Lisa can get started. And please, everyone, bear with me. We've been doing this for years, but as the historian, I'm I'm a little bit of the luddite of the group, so it might take me just a minute. Okay, Lisa, can you confirm I'm sharing this out correctly? Yes, it looks great. Thank you, Rebecca. Great, thank you. So go, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Gavoni, as Rebecca introduced me. I'm the housing planner for the Montgomery County Planning Department, and I'm here to provide a little bit of an overview and talk about the zoning requirements and the permitting process for access to build an accessory dwelling unit in the county and in Tacoma Park. Next slide. But first, let's get some boring code out of the way. As well. Let's talk about how an ADU or accessory dwelling unit is defined in Montgomery County Code. Um, an accessory dwelling unit is a second dwelling that is subordinate to an existing one family detached home and has its own provisions for cooking, eating, sanitation, and sleeping. And an ADU can be in addition, like a basement, or it could be a separate structure on the same lot detached, but they have to have the same address, which is important. Um, next slide. So it wouldn't be me if I didn't give some grandiose discussion about the high level of why ADUs are important. And I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but mm -hmm. they are really important in the housing landscape, especially in Montgomery County. Um, so first, they can help increase the supply of housing. I'm going to mute someone. Sorry. Um, so they can help increase the supply of housing in the county through a process with this idea that we call gentle density. And this idea of gentle, gentle density is that ground level, small scale housing can have a huge impact on our housing supply. And we can talk a little bit about the numbers, but we made some changes in 2019 that almost doubled the amount of ADUs we're seeing in the county per year. It's still not a lot, but it's, it's a start and somewhere and we're hoping to increase the numbers even more. They also can help provide supplemental income to homeowners. Almost 20% of owners in this county are cost burdened. That means they're spending too much money on their housing costs, even as owners. So they can help in that regard to provide supplemental income. And they can help provide house people of all ages, including seniors. Um, we, the vast majority of older adults in Montgomery County, about seven out of 10 want to age in place. And ADUs are a great way that we can help our senior population age in place. Next slide. So this is another boring slide, but I think it's important because one of the fundamental takeaways from the ADU changes that we made in 2019 is this idea of incrementalism or incremental change. And so over the, from the past 10 years-ish, we have slowly revised the, zone, the zoning code to loosen up the restrictions around ADUs. So before 2013, ADUs were only allowed through the special exception process, now known as the conditional use process, which required planning department review and hearing examiner review, which, which is a long process. It's also expensive. So it took a really long time to get these units built. Then around 2012, GTA 1211 was introduced and it allowed accessory apartments, as they were known at the time, in the county as a limited use by right process. 
And so what by right means is you have to meet certain requirements, including a distance from other ADUs, parking, and detached were not allowed in most of the county. But if you met these requirements, you can go straight to DHCA and Department of Permitting Service to build the unit. It cut out the planning department. So this is important because it really helped streamline the process. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that it's a little bit of a different process if you're in a historic district, which Dan will talk about. Um, but for most of the county, it's a by right process right now. And then in 2018, there was ZTA 1807, and it changed the conditions so that if you did not meet the parking requirements, instead of going through the hearing examiner, you could go get a waiver, which also cut down the process. So we've, you know, we've spent a lot of time cutting down process and red tape to build them. But the big changes that were built in 2019 that I just briefly mentioned and we'll talk about tonight um, is that it allows a, a 20, sorry. <coughs> sorry, I have like a tickle on my throat. So in 2019, ZTA 1901 was introduced and we'll talk about that tonight. Next slide. So this is a map that shows existing small lot residential detached zoning in, in Tacoma Park. And that's a fancy way of saying it's mostly single family zoning. And basically all of the yellow on this map is what we call R60. And this in ZTA 1901 was opened up all of this area to build detached ADUs. Next slide. So what did ZTA 1901 do generally? So it was introduced by Council Member Hans Riemer to revise the provisions for attached and detached ADUs. And it allows detached ADUs in R200, R90, and as relevant to Tacoma Park, R60, which is most of Tacoma Park. It also changed and reduced parking standards around one mile of Metro Rail, Purple Line, and Mark stations. And this is also important for Tacoma Park because Generally, all of Tacoma Park falls in the one mile transit buffer, either from a future Purple Line station or the Tacoma Metro station. It also removed the requirement that you had to be 300 to 500 feet from another ADU so that two neighbors could have ADUs now. Next slide. So briefly, I'll touch upon the ADU requirements. Um, the maximum gross floor area or size for the, a detached ADU must be the least of or the smallest of either 50% of the footprint, 10% of the lot area, or 1,200 square feet of or 1,200 square feet of gross floor area. This is important because there's a lot of small lots and houses in Tacoma Park, which will, could be a very limiting factor um, in the size of your ADU. And ADUs must have a separate entrance located on the side or rear of the property. And we mentioned on-street parking, but if you're not in that one mile buffer around Metro, Mark, or Purple Line, you need to have an additional space or 320 feet, around 320 square feet. Next. The property must also be the owner's primary residence. Both units cannot be rented. You can if the owners move out of the property, the ADU must be eliminated and you cannot use an ADU for a short term rental. And the ADU must be licensed whether they are rented or not. Um, licensing generally for the county is through DHA and through the city is through the city of Tacoma Park. ADUs must be in compliance with the requirements of Montgomery County Code, uh, which is the zoning ordinance, housing standards and landlord and tenant relations. There we go. Thank you, Rebecca. So next slide. So this slide illustrates the players generally involved in building an ADU in both a historic district and not a historic district. The big difference between the two is that for ADUs in historic district, you need to start with the historic preservation office. And Dan's gonna, Dan and Rebecca are gonna talk about that next. Um, but since ADUs are a by right process generally in the county, if you're not in a historic district, there's really no other role of the planning department. So that's great. Uh, I'm a little sad that I don't get to work on them, but it does really help streamline the process. So first, let's, let's talk about the process overall. So if you're not in a historic district before applying for a building permit with the Department of Permitting Services or DPS, you apply for an ADU with the Department of Housing and Community Affairs or DHCA. 
your application is received and processed by DHCA, and the application will not be accepted until all documents and payment are received. And these documents include proof of residency, drawings, an affidavit of uh, proof of registration with the Maryland Department of Environment if your house was built between before 1978, and fees that are paid it, and fees need to be paid, which in 2021 was about 250 for filing fee and 220 for a public sign notice fee. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you, so I just want to say like our next slide will be resources, which will have links to basically everything that I'm saying right now. Um, but once an application is accepted, it's forwarded to DHC's code enforcement, and they will create a case, and an inspector will reach out to the owner to conduct a preliminary inspection. After the preliminary inspection, the owner may take the inspection report and stamp drawings to the DPS for any permits that are needed to build the ADO, but construction, alteration, or renovation permits cannot be started with DPS before DHCA preliminary inspection report is completed. And once all the work is completed, DHCA code conducts a final inspection. And once that inspection is passed, the ADU will be approved and the owner may then, may then apply with the city of Tacoma Park for a rental license. Now, if your ADU is denied, you can appeal to the Office of Zoning and Administrative Hearings or OSA. And, uh, that was just a lot of information I know. So I'll be sure to put links in the chat to the summarize all this information. We'll be sure to send out this, this PowerPoint too. And Alex tonight is also gonna talk about the city's additional requirements for licensing. Next slide. And this is just a link of resources that I was talking about. Um, I'm gonna put a couple of them in the chat because I think they're really important that kind of like summarize what I just said verbally, but it's you know important for you to be able to refer to that along with that PowerPoint. But that's my presentation on general zoning overview for accessory dwelling units. Thank you so much, Lisa. All right. I can get, okay, there we go. I'm now going to get Dan's presentation up. I will share out my screen. All right, Dan, can you see the PowerPoint okay? Yep, we're good. Great. All right, take it away. Uh, so just to, to piggyback on, or good evening, I'm, I'm Dan Bruchert. I'm one of the cultural resource planners, um, and I work primarily in, in the regulatory work in our office. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of building off of what Lisa talked about and focusing primarily on work on historic districts. You can go to the next slide, Rebecca. So just like any other change to the exterior of your property, um, whether you're designated individually or in a historic district, uh, building an ADU still requires a historic area work permit, which we call a HOP. Um, you know, it's it's a relatively straightforward process. There's no filing fee associated with the permit. Um, your your application quite simply needs to include the basic property information, the existing conditions. Um, depending on how extensive it is, would need both photographs and drawings, and then the proposed changes. Typically, there's a descriptive narrative that goes along with that, and then drawings as well. Um, once you've submitted, um, our staff reviews it. We write a recommendation in a formal staff report to the Historic Preservation Commission. They review it. Um, at the meeting, somebody makes a motion, and they vote on the proposal. And if everybody's done their job correctly, it gets approved relatively straightforwardly. We go to the next step, Rebecca. Um, so we we don't sort of look at, at whether or not this satisfies the ADU requirements, um, and we'll we'll touch on that a little bit later. Our our primary concerns is how will the work impact the historic character of the site and the surrounding district. So that's that's what we're charged with. Um, the the um, there's a master plan. Historic districts are effectively an amendment to the county's general plan. So um, they're they're part of that. They're sort of set in stone in law. Um, we we look at these and we evaluate 
you know, the, the size, the style, the materials, the placement, all as it relates to the building, but also the context of um, both the site and, and the surrounding neighborhood. So, so we look at all of that. And in historic districts, we're governed by Chapter 24A of County Code, which is the historic preservation chapter. The Secretary of the Interior's Standards for Rehabilitation, which are a nationally recognized set of standards for um, constructing in um, a historic context. And then there are district specific guidelines for um, a number of the districts, including Tacoma Park and Chevy Chase in the county. Next slide. So this is the fun part. These are the pretty pictures. So we've actually already done some uh, some ADUs in uh, in in well in the county, but in Tacoma Park and and in Kensington. This is on Willow Avenue. This is actually I think the first ADU that we saw. What you see is is the historic bungalow with a rear addition and its original historic garage. Well, the original intention was to use the garage foundation, but the slab had cracked and uh, nearly a hundred years of um, after nearly a hundred years of of load from the the hillside, the garage just couldn't be salvaged at all. So if you want to go to the next slide, inspired by the garage and the placement, they built a one and a half story ADU for their in-laws or for one of the in-laws um, that included both exterior access and included the construction of a hallway. So the um, the the grandparents could go from their own unit into the house without having to to exit the um, exit the property or exit brave the elements. Um, again, the the overall issues were um, the design compatibility and the material compatibility. And you know when we looked at this with sort of the jumping off point was the historic garage, but also um, our instructions to the architect when we spoke with them were sort of think about this as a, as a carriage house, um, you know, which is a, a historic building form to, to use as a, as a jumping off point. Um, this one is set pretty far back from the street, so it doesn't have that much impact on the streetscape, and we think it's pretty successful. If you want to go to the next one, Rebecca. So this is actually in, in Kensington on the left, you see it looking up the driveway and on the right, you see it um, looking towards the street. This is a an older but not original garage to the property. It's built right on the property line. Uh, I think that's one of the other things that we run into with these a lot is that where there is a, an existing garage uh, to work within that, it, it doesn't meet current zoning setbacks. So usually a, a change in location has to happen. Uh, again, this is the this, some of the same issues we we ran into is there were some structural issues with the building, um, and and we did determined that it needed to come down. And once Rebecca goes to the next slide here, we can show you the finished product. Um, so again, you can see it's it's this one is actually a little bit closer uh, to the house than than the one we looked at previously, uh, but it's behind the fence. It has a front porch, so it still has um, sort of the cottage feel. But you know, looking at it next to the historic garage immediately adjacent to it, it really fits in well with, you know, with the streetscape and and the type of building that you'd expect to see from from the street. And we can go to the next one, Rebecca. Um, so this is a um, in Montgomery Avenue. It's a non-historic infill construction, um, and this is not actually a dwelling unit. It's it's a building that was constructed for recreation purposes, but it it sort of fits into the design scheme that we're looking for. And if you want to go to the next slide. So they they built this behind them and you can see it's relatively close to the, the house to the right. Um, but again, the, the building sort of takes the form of a slightly expanded garage. And, and I think that that fit in well with um, the surrounding streetscape. That's a building that you would expect to see in that area. There was an existing driveway apron that they were um, connecting this building to. And uh, this is another one that we think is a, is a very sex successful design and a very simple form uh, that met the owner's needs. And the last one, um, so this is the, this was the, the previous building, simple, you know, one car garage with a textured concrete foundation. Um, again, this is another one of those buildings that's engaged into the the hill. So the the weight of of dirt and tree roots over a number of years had damaged the building. 
Uh, and the owner runs a business out of the house and wanted office space. And if we go to the next slide. So the owner, the, the architect used that original form as the basis for an entirely new construction. Um, again, from, from the street, most of what's constructed to the left and the rear is obscured, but you still have the same general sense of, of the form. Um, and they preserve the doors, which are purely decorative and non-functional in that, in that instance. If you want to go to the next slide, Rebecca. Um, so again, getting into um, the way that we review these projects, we don't know that they're building an accessory dwelling unit in their house. Our, our review is um, purely for architectural compatibility. If they let us know, we we sort of try and file that information away, but it doesn't require any additional review than any other um, any other hop in our office. And in fact, we saw a slideshow yesterday that was developed um, that showed a project on Columbia Avenue that we'd been dealing with. And Rebecca and I both turned to each other and said, huh, we didn't know that that had an ADU in the basement. So, you know, a lot of times they just blend in and uh, simply by providing the access and and code compliant basement windows, it's a pretty easy change to, to make. Um, and there's generally more flexibility to changes to the foundation and at the rear of, of historic buildings anyway. And next slide. So I mean these are these are sort of globally global recommendations. Um, are you know find a design professional who's familiar with historic preservation and and the Montgomery County requirements. I think that's both uh, building, but also knows the ADU requirements because there are obviously boxes that you have to check and and requirements along there. So um, you know I think it's it's. Oh, we lost Dan. Hold on just a second. I'm, Dan, I'm, we, I'm sorry. I yeah, I I got lost for a second. I don't know what was sorry. going on. I apologize. No worries. Um so so the other the other recommendation is contact our office early in the process. We can offer um, informal reviews and, and we're happy to look at things. Sometimes it's just schematic and, you know, we can, so we can set up something that's informal. The historic preservation you submit your plans and we write a staff report and then the HPC holds a hearing on the record. They will provide feedback and recommendations, but not make a final determination that evening. Uh, they basically give you homework and come back. And if you make those changes, uh, it's usually a pretty easy approval. Um, and and just another recommendation is is come see us early because the Department of Permitting Services will not review your other permits until you have an approved hop. So um, going in for your building permits before you have your approved hop is putting the the cart before the horse. Next slide. Oh, well, there was one slide that had my contact info on, but that's OK. Uh, we'll put that in the chat and and uh, when uh, the folks are done talking, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Great, thank you, Dan. All right. Next, we will have Alexander Friedman um, from the city of Tacoma Park. Alex, are you there? Yep. Hi there. Hey. And um, right, I want to invite Ian to um, Ian Chamberlain to join me as well, as he will be guiding us through some of the information we're going to cover. Hi, Ian. All right. Let me get my share screen up. All right, can you see that okay? Yes, that looks all right. Okay, great. Um, so just as a quick introduction, uh, my name is Alex Friedman. I'm the acting planning manager for the city of Tacoma Park. Um, and I would like to, uh, we're going to cover a few of the Tacoma Park specific processes that um, folks will encounter when pursuing um, really any building project, but in this case, um, you know, uh, an accessory dwelling unit um, as a building project. 
Um, and I'm going to invite Ian Chamberlain, who is our um, Deputy Director of Public Works, to talk us through some of these processes, uh, since he and his department are the ones who oversee most of them. Yeah. Um, I'll ask briefly, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. This is not my regular setup or my regular setting, so uh, thanks for tolerating me. Um, all right, so our typical process is going to run through three major permit types. Those are the only three major permit types that the city of Tacoma Park covers. Um, everything else is going to be run through Montgomery County Department of Permitting Services. So all of your trades, um, structural, all of your common building permits are done through Montgomery County proper. Um, now, if you're in a historic region uh, or historic district, excuse me, then you also are going to engage in the historic process as well. Um, but I want to speak specifically to the permit sets that the city of Tacoma Park is going to do. Um, and there's really just the three big categories. Um, it's Tacoma Park. So the first and probably the most complicated category is going to be related to trees. Uh, the second and arguably equally complicated is related to stormwater. Uh, and the third uh, is right of way. And that's fairly basic in comparison to the other two. Um, so the tree system or the tree permits are, are kind of three basic groups. Um, there's the tree impact assessment, the tree protection plan, and the tree removal process. Um, if you want to build anything in the city of Tacoma Park within 50 feet of an urban forest tree, that's a tree that's 24 inches around um, at chest height, or seven and five eighths inches, seven and five eighth inches in diameter at that same chest height. Um, then you're going to engage in the tree impact assessment process at a minimum. Um, basically, it's the what would you like to build? How would you like to build it? Where would you like to build it? Um, get those answers uh, to the city, and then the city will say if it's an acceptable process. Um, if there are more uh, items required, then you'll go from a tree impact assessment to the requirement of a tree protection plan. The tree protection plan is just an extension of that first step with the impact assessment. Um, the tree protection plan is going to formally require you to do certain things. So that'll be um, specific root protection, or if you have excavation, they'll define the ways in which you can excavate or cannot. Uh, and this is all done in the hopes of preserving the health of trees on your property or a nearby property. So even if the tree is not on the property that the construction is occurring on, um, you're still required to take steps to protect that tree. Um, it's Tacoma Park, and we've done this in this fashion for I think it's greater than 30 years at this point. So it's um, it's a pretty pretty well well bit process. So I'll go ahead and skip to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about stormwater. Um, this is a new and exciting topic, it seems these days, um, but really it's it's been here for a while. Um, the stormwater management program, uh, when it comes to construction, is only triggered at that 5,000 square foot of disturbance uh, number. So if your construction is completely interior, you have no stormwater requirement whatsoever. Um, if you have an addition onto a home and the entire project only disturbs 3,000 square feet, again, no stormwater requirement from the city of Tacoma Park. Um, Department of Permitting Services may still require you to take some stormwater abatement steps, um, but that's through their stormwater requirement program, and it's triggered through a different process than ours. Um, I should also mention that on each of these slides, the specific staff member that you'd like to reach out to with specific questions is listed there on the slide. Um, I always recommend email. Uh, and if it's not here on the slides, the best thing to do is to go to the city's website. There's a search bar at the top of every city of Tacoma Park page and just type in stormwater management or contact for stormwater management. It'll get you to the correct staff member. In this case, it's the city's engineer, Ali Kalulian. Uh, with reference to trees, it's the city's urban forest manager, and that is Marty Fry. Uh, and we'll go to the last slide that I think I'm going to chat about here, and that's going to be about the city right of way. The one thing not mentioned on this slide is that there is actually a right of way permit. If you need to dig and connect a utility, 
um, or if a sprinkler requirement is triggered by your construction and so you need to upsize your water house connection, uh, it's likely that you'll impact the, the public right-of-way. That's when a right-of-way permit is required, which is separate from the ones listed here on this slide. Um, that was my oversight and, and sorry folks for that one. Um, permits are, are a very exciting thing, so I hope nobody's on the edge of their seat on this one. Um, so the right-of-way permits, the overarching right-of-way permit is, is literally related to that. So if you're doing construction activities within the right-of-way, you need to pull a right-of-way permit. So that's for construction, excavation um, within the right-of-way. Those are often pulled by subcontractors or by um, the utility companies themselves. So WSSE may do that. Um, but that's the right of way permit and it's not listed here on the slide. The other ones that are listed here on the slide are much more regular. So a construction dumpster or storage container. This is commonly used with uh, home renovations. So um, it's a very straightforward permit. Uh, you apply state that you don't have space on the lot uh, for the item uh, and then show that you're going to place it in a safe space on the city's right of way. Uh, and those are almost always green lit. Those are only good for six weeks at a time. You can uh, extend the permit uh, at written request, but um, I think it's only a matter of two extensions. So um, it's not a ton of time on a single permit, but you can continue to reapply. And so long as you stay up on your extensions, you'll be you'll be fine throughout your process. Uh, the new driveway apron is a bit confusing for some folks. Uh, because they don't have a sidewalk on their property. Uh, walkability has been made a priority by the mayor and council for a good number of years now. And so every single new driveway apron that goes in in the city of Tacoma Park has a um, ADA crossing required. So with that ADA required crossing, it's just a matter of showing the 2% slope close to the street. Um, if you have additional questions to that, I'm happy to uh, answer those questions at a later time. Uh, and then the last one is a fence in the right of way. Uh, Tacoma Park is known for having a bit of a jagged smile when it comes to engaging the right of way. So your neighbor's property may be, you know, all the way to the edge of the sidewalk and two houses down that right of way line was recorded in 1967 versus 1937. And it may be 16 feet behind the sidewalk. Um, it's an older community. This is what happens in older communities is you end up with these kind of jagged smiles where the right of way line will step forward or step backward with each individual property. Um, so it's entirely possible that you'll need to place a fence that is exactly in line with your neighbor's fence, um, but it will be on city right of way. Um, the city doesn't have a big opposition to this. The only thing that we say is that if we need to come through and widen a road, um, which has not happened in my tenure, um, or if we need to install other public infrastructure, um, then that fence may be removed and reset. Um, and, and there's not much you can say against it. So that's how the fence in the right of way permit works. Um, the couple other things, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't have the chat window pulled up in front of me. I think I just saw a question about a um, drain connection. Rebecca, can you confirm? Let me check. Yes, Ian, if you Thank wish you so to much. connect a roof leader or other area underground drain on a private property to a city storm drain or drain pipe, what is involved or required by the city? Fantastic. That's an excellent question. Um, that's a right of way permit. Uh, that's how we do that connection. Um, there are several properties that lie fairly low in a dell, so that would be kind of in, in the cleft of a, a series of tall points. Uh, and those properties tend to have city uh, infrastructure at or near uh, their boundaries. And so when it's time for them to dewater their specific space, um, they'll ask to connect to the city storm drain system. Um, it's almost always approved. Um, I don't know of one that was not allowed I take that back. I know of one that was disallowed on an older system, but they were required to connect to the newer pipe in the front of the property instead. Um, because we didn't know that the older um, pipe system 
was uh, robust enough to handle an additional load, we required them to, to plummet towards the front of the property and connect to the newer pipe, which did handle it without question. Um, so we almost always allow that. Um, I won't say always because there are extenuating circumstances. Um, the one thing that I do know that we almost always uh, connect and allow is um, sump discharge. Uh, so the discharge from the sump pump, if you put it up on the property and it drains back to the same foundation, it has the effect of watering a sponge and that can be um, less effective than any of us wish. So we allow space to the stormwater system because typically those sump dischargers are happening after peak flows and rain events. Um, so we've had no issues whatsoever connecting those sumps to the city stormwater system. Um, and then I think I'm going to advance to the last slide, which might be more of Alex's expertise. Um, before I give it over to Alex, I will say, though, if you guys have any questions about the right of way permits, the stormwater permits or the tree permits, um, please do reach out to the city of Tacoma Park, um, reach out to Public Works. Uh, I'm probably your best expert for the right of way. My name again is Ian. Um, Marty Fry is the urban forest manager. He's going to be your best point of contact for all of your tree questions. And Ali Kalilian is going to be your best point of contact for all of the um, stormwater engineering questions. So your stormwater permit questions. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Alex and thank you all very much for your patience while I mumble through this. Um, and it looks like uh, Microsoft Teams was nice enough to not cut out on me. So, Alex. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. And um, this is our last slide. Um, I wanted to add this at the end um, only because once uh, some folks are looking to create an accessory dwelling unit with the hopes of potentially renting it out. Um, uh, and we have a specific rental housing licensing program in the city. Um, the city of Tacoma Park requires licensing for all rental units, um, no matter their size. And they are issued on either an annual, bi biennial, or a temporary basis. Um, and there are uh, five key pieces of this. Um, in full transparency, uh, this is a process managed by our housing division, uh, who is unable to be here tonight. So. Um, I don't want to pretend that I am the expert about this process. However, um, all of this information is available on our website. Uh, so the, the major components are, um, first and foremost, a rental housing license application, uh, which is a, a fairly straightforward application about um, what your plan is uh, as far as your rentals go. Uh, there is a license and transfer fee, which um, in 2022 was $116 per unit. Uh, there is a requirement to pass a lead poisoning prevention compliance process. Um, all of these pieces, once completed, lead to a property inspection just to check that um, everything is up to snuff as far as um, legal requirements for dwelling. And then the final piece um, is a landlord certification, which um, is asks the owners of all um, housing properties uh, in this process to be certified by the city prior to issuance of any licensing, um, mostly so that uh, we can assure that all of the people going through this process of becoming landlords are familiar with all the local, state, and federal laws surrounding rental units and um, having tenants on your in your properties. Um, so this is um it's a fairly straightforward process um but i would definitely encourage you to check out the website again as ian mentioned the city of tacoma park website has a great search bar if you just look for rental housing licensing there is an abundance of information there and um, any additional direct contact feel free to reach out to the housing division um, via their email address housing at tacomaparkmd.gov or our department phone number, which is listed on the slide below. And that is all I've got from the city of Tacoma Park for right now. Thank you oh, so much, Alex and Ian. Oh, sorry. Uh, the, uh, the last slide I forgot that I put in. For more information, go here. That's all. <laughs> Great, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, so that that concludes the presentation part of the evening um, from 
from each of our separate but related um, disciplines. Um, so we can open the floor now um, to q and A. I know we've tried our our best to keep up. I believe we have kept up with most of the questions of the chat. There's one um, that I'm going to to read out. Um, and I think that this is a question really for for the city. If there's more information, perhaps we can suggest some resources to follow up. So in the chat, there's a comment that if the owners move out, maybe this is for Lisa as well, if the owners move out and the tenants need want to stay on with the blessings of the owners, of course, do the regulations accommodate this scenario or are the tenants evicted? If so, how do we maintain affordable housing? So it is, that is an interesting question. Like if somebody is, you know, is renting out their ADU, but then they sell, what happens to the renters? There may be some nuance that I that I don't know that DH they might, and uh, I can certainly point you to the direction of the person at DHA to ask. But from my understanding, the ADU is it's tied to the, the owner of the house. So if they moved, that application is no longer valid. But that does not mean that the new owner cannot apply for an ADU license through the county and, and the city too. So I think there's a little bit of, of nuance there that I don't know that it means that exactly that tenant will be evicted, but it, I think that it will require a new application. Hi, can I speak? Yes, please. Yes. All right, this is Bern Kelly. I'm the one who uh, asked the question. Mm -hmm. um, there's another scenario also because it's happened to me. Um, you own a house, you lose a spouse, you find a new spouse and you move in with the new spouse, but you had an apartment in your house and you no longer live in it. And it's known as the marriage penalty because you're not allowed to have your tenant if you don't live in your house. You can't have your home occupation. I've been up against the, in court about this and trying to change the rules of Montgomery County because it, it, it's, you know, it's not intentional, obviously, but it exists. And this question I asked tonight in the chat is another, you know, as a, as a land planner, as an architect, landscape architect, and someone who cares about affordable housing and has rental units in my former house, I, I, I had to spend $9,000 to get the county off my back and allow my tenants to remain in my house. And uh, I think we need... Um, to look at the rules and and uh, you know not have this hiccup or this glitch in the rules because the tenants are the one who suffers if if you know even if you sell your house and the tenant wants to stay what they have to leave and then come back when the new owner you know there's a period there where the house is not occupied so you know we need to improve the rules I hope that you at the staff or or you know uh, I, I don't want to have to take on more responsibility to get these rules modified. But I believe this is why I attended tonight, because this is a this is a sincere problem. And another problem is that when uh, we were part of Prince George's County in Montgomery County and 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 Park, and we unified into Montgomery County, we were under a different set of rules. We have houses on the formerly annexed area outside the city itself of Prince George's County, which have grandfathered uh, rules, which you have single family dwellings with add units. And the block I live on, the 300 block of Circle Avenue, almost every one of the houses has additional units. And they're called add units and they were permitted. Our UNO permits have this. Again, Montgomery County, the code enforcement people came and said, no, nope, that's not right. You can't have that. And I said, you're wrong. And, and I had to go to court. And this is really annoying because I'm the only champion in my neighborhood of these rules. And, you know, it's just logical what, you know, you all are nodding your heads, but these problems exist with the regulations. And I do hope that you as staff in both the city and the county can dig deeper into these problems and, and have the regulations modified. We need exemptions or exceptions or grandfathers. I want on a grandfather. Okay, I won my court cases, but it, it, it cost me a lot of money and it cost me a lot of anxiety because I thought I was going to lose my tenants. And, uh, you know, it's just a problem that exists and I want you guys to know about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, we have another question or a, yeah, a question, sort of a statement in the chat from Mike saying, if you do not live in a historic district, can you build a detached ADU that is totally modern in style? Um, so I going through what Lisa had said, you know, if you're not in a historic district, there is no other portion of the county where style is adjudicated. <laughs> so I believe that that yes, you know, if you don't live in the historic district, then there is no design review. Now that doesn't mean, for example, you know, it still has to meet the setbacks and the other and the other requirements. Lisa, do you have anything you'd want to add about that? The only thing that I would add, and I don't think this is relevant to Tacoma Park, but if you're in an HOA, you do have to tell them you're building an ADU and they might have their own rules. So that's something to keep in mind if you're in an HOA, but I I don't think there's many, if any, in Tacoma Park. Yes, thank you for that. And I'll say what, too, in terms what's of an this, HOA, what's an HOA? A homeowners association, so they can oh. have you know rules for oh, okay. the the houses that live in their neighborhood. Um, in terms of the the style of the ADUs, and Dan could potentially speak to some of this. Um, there are a number of resources within the historic district that are classified as non-contributing. They're either out of period for the historic district, or they are totally new construction. And we have reviewed, and the HPC has approved infill housing. Um, they've approved some pretty modern looking stuff um, with within the district, you know, with a lot of glass, you know, some corner windows, you know, interesting roof forms, things like that. Um, so it's not out of the realm of possibility either that something that is much more modern or something like what you might see in Dwell magazine would be out of character for the district. It depends on the property. It depends on the street. Um, and we would, you know, as Dan said, want to have a conversation early on um, with anybody considering that um, and their design professional just to see, you know, what you're thinking, what you desire and what might work. Mike, did you have any other like follow up to that or any other thoughts? No. OK. Dan, did you have any other thoughts on that? No? OK. Susan, you have your hand up, please. Oh, you're muted, Susan. Great, thank you. This has been really helpful. Um, and um, I I did actually have an EDU in a former house on Maple Avenue, um, but it was interior. Um, so we had to follow up all the housing all the regulations, both county and city, in terms of getting a rental license, but we didn't have other, any other issues. But um, with these new regulations, um, there is, for anybody who's going to do this, the issue of having to sort of weave back between the county, the city, and the HBC. And I wonder if, and this, I think, Alex, this would, this might not be in your domain completely, and it's probably not in Ian's either, but if someone in the city could take a leadership role in bringing together all of these pieces um, so that there'd be a place on the city website where you could go to find out, because I don't think there is anything right now, to find out, okay, what are the steps for developing um, a legal ADU? that would have info about the HPC. It might not have all the information that was provided here, but um, except for, you know, it's very, it's great to have it in one place as we're hearing about it, but for reference or for people who are not um, in on this um, Zoom session, it just would be tremendously helpful if somebody in the city could take the lead um, in providing this information in one place and work with, with Rebecca and Lisa's office and um, with and Dan and with the county um, planning department. Thank you, Susan. I, I think that is a, a great idea and that is something that um, falls within our department's jurisdiction. So I'll, I'll pass that along. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Let me see. I see somebody is typing in the chat. Does anybody else have any any questions? No. no? Okay. Time to say goodbye. <laughs> well, 
if anybody thinks of any questions, um, I had written to Susan in in the chat that we will be posting this recording on um, via via YouTube out of the planning department um, and the the city whatever capabilities they have to post this meeting as well. Um, and we will also be um, aggregating the PowerPoints, the presentations that were mm -hmm. given so that it's accessible in one link. And Susan, to your comment as well, um, the planning department, a couple, I think it was a couple years ago now, maybe two, three years ago, produced a really nice kind of illustrated flow chart talking about development review. And it came, right. it, it was available as a PDF and it was also available as kind of a fold out pamphlet um, that we could hand out to people to walk them through the process and there were hyperlinks for the web version. If I'm remembering this this one correctly, Lisa, hopefully I <laughs> yeah. Rebecca, um, can you send yeah. the this whole presentation by email to those of us? I mean, I don't even know what application I'm on. I tried to get on Zoom, it didn't work. I don't know how to get a hold of all of you and I don't know where you're located. Are you here at the Tacoma Park Community Center or where are you? Sure. So um, Alex and Ian are with the city of Tacoma Park, um, okay. but Dan and Lisa and I work in park and planning up in Wheaton. So the, oh. power, the PowerPoints themselves are, are these really large documents. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this on our website as a PDF. So I will email everybody that was interested in this meeting whether or not they will be they were able to attend and i will send you the link to our website where the recording will live and where all of these presentations will live so you can get it on the web because i'm worried if i try and email it to people it's it's going to be too large of a file and okay, it will but, bounce back but do you have a general website like i can get on right now and find you folks yes yeah. Yes, we do. Can you, can you just set, say it out loud and I can write it down here? Yes. She's on the phone. Yeah. I mean, it's a, some some yes, of us are no seniors problem. and we're not so savvy about all this. So, no, I completely understand. Um, the name oh, is a little is. Un, unwieldy. Okay, I just saw it. It just popped up. What was it? Gum, Montgomery, what? Montgomeryplanning.org. Planning. .org. Okay, that's fine. So that's the planning department's website. And if you want to go directly to historic preservation, it's montgomeryplanning.org backslash historic. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, there is another question in the chat, um, which Lisa, maybe you you could tackle it. I think it might be a DHCA issue. Can you share the reasoning behind the ADUs not conveying to a new owner? What was the council's deliberation on that or the, the discussion that happened? Good question. Sure. So I'm not, I don't remember. It was a long four years ago. Um, but I I think I can I definitely can follow up with DHCA. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting is we are about to start a new council session. A, a new, the, count, the new council for Montgomery County is going to be seated on, on Monday. And the first thing they do, the first thing that was introduced was the zoning text amendment that dealt with accessory dwelling units four years ago. So I think that, you know, there was some comments about potential changes. There's a new council. There's a new opportunity to look at changes that might be barriers to building accessory dwelling units in the county. So I just think that's important to keep in mind. But um, if you want i'll put my email on the chat if you want to follow up with me i can email clifton at the dhca and is it correct to say rebecca that um in the follow-up email that you're going to send it will also have contact information for all of the speakers on today's call as well yes yes i will include all of that information and I do see some comments um, about some issues accessing the meeting this evening and and the link. I do apologize um, to the comment earlier. We we operate with Microsoft Teams, which I know is a little um, different than than Zoom, though there are some similarities. Um, so I apologize for any 
any confusion with that. I'm glad so many people were able to join us this evening and we will make all of the speaker presentations and information accessible um, to everybody who attended and everybody who wanted to attend and then those people who don't even know they want an ADU yet but want to find the information about it with with the city. Oh, I see I see a hand raised. Um, did you have a question, ma'am? S. Etienne? Can you unmute? I think you're muted. I'm just trying to figure out. I've never been on this. You know, I, con I contacted my council member. She said they're not taking any more registrations. Somebody else sent me an email saying you can still get on and gave me this link. I've never been on this link. I have questions about can you get one of those little houses that are on wheels and just wheel it into your backyard and use that? As an ADU unit? You need a foundation. You need a foundation. Meaning, can I cement my backyard? And is that enough of a foundation? Or you have to have people digging it up and stuff? I would reach out to DPS for all your foundation questions. But I, that is actually something that did come up. I think I think you can do that, but you need a foundation. OK. And then some of us who want to age in, age in place, we're thinking of like using a basement and hiring a personal, like a nurse type of person who would stay overnight. <clears throat> Um, does that require any of your help or can can I go ahead and hire someone to take care of me and put them in my downstairs and pay them, you know, their regular whatever salary you would and have them have free housing? Well, That's it doesn't sound, question. you know, it, so in general, I'll just mm -hmm. talk about from from building and design in the historic district. If you want to convert a space that is not currently a bedroom into a bedroom, it does need to meet some fire code accessibility. You need an egress window. Okay. So you might you might need a larger window than you currently have if this is a basement space yes. that you are yes. converting into a bedroom. So there's there's that which would need historic preservation review if you were in the historic district and if you needed to put in a bigger window for for anybody you know if if you were hiring someone to stay with you if you wanted to do an accessory dwelling unit or you you know you wanted to convert non you know sleeping space into a bedroom you would need to do that but Lisa, if someone were just converting a basement into a bedroom that's not necessarily an accessory dwelling unit is it is it, does they need to have the kitchen and the bathroom? Does it need to be a fully functional separate unit to be an ADU? So from my understanding, and again, DHA would know is an ADU is sleeping, sanitation, and, and cooking. And so from my understanding, the dividing line is an oven. So if you have an oven, it's an accessory dwelling unit. But if you want to take the oven out, it could just be a separate, uh, you know, living space. You don't need to go through the process. Okay. Could I mention, could I mention that that uh, egress um, for you, S. Etienne, um, mm -hmm. is a five square foot uh, aperture is a conforming egress. So a window that has five square feet of opening that allows a person to get out or a fireman to get in. That is the regulation there. Okay. Thank you. My neighbor has one, so I'm very familiar with the egress windows. Yeah. Great. Plus the plus the uh, downstairs has its own entrance, mm -hmm. you know, but, and its own bathroom, washer dryer. I mean, it's a seven hundred square foot unit. Mm -hmm. But I still have to go through the housing authority in Tacoma Park, right? E even you know, if I have like a medical person taking care of me. Alex, I have a question. Um. That is a question that I'm happy to follow up with in more detail, but to my understanding, um, as long as they're uh, not, a, it depends on whether or not they're formally renting from you, I think. Um, and I think there's a difference between having someone who is living with you in your house versus mm -hmm. renting out a unit to someone who is paying a monthly rent and um, those the, the former would be, I don't believe any requirements from the city. The latter would require going through the rental licensing process. Um, but if you'd like to connect with our housing manager, um, I, I would encourage um, giving him uh, either an email or a phone call. Using What's the name? the name? His is name Gordon? is Devin, Devin McNally. 
And is um, he in the community center? He is up on the third floor right next to my office. Great. Okay, thank you. I'll be uh, up there. Come by anytime. Thank you. Alex, this is this is David Eubanks. Uh, um, I'm also with the city, um, just for everyone else's info. Um, what you're describing is a uh, owner occupied unit. If if you are um, renting it out to the person that's assisting you, which is a slightly different um, rental licensing process. It's a modified, simpler version um, where we still require inspections. We still require an application. Um, it's just that the, the license that you are provided is neither annual or biannual. Um, it's kind of a permanent thing. Um, okay. So that's that's the only nuance to our rental license, and if those are the circumstances under which you're 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 renting your uh, a room. Okay. Question. So, question related to Tacoma Park. Um, one is the oven, as Lisa mentioned, uh, for the woman who was questioning, and two is whether or not it's your primary residence. It's guest quarters. That's a little different. And then, of course, what David just, I believe it was David just said, as a uh, owner-occupied condition. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know uh, all the rules related to each thing, but I do know that those are the definitions of the three conditions that we're talking about. Great. I'll check into them. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for adding that context. That's very helpful. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm sure people will definitely have, have questions afterwards. So if you mm -hmm. and your neighbors do, please feel free um, to reach out to me or any of the other team members on this call and look for an email from me probably early next week. It's going to take um, our team a little time to find you know, a spot for this on the website um, and we'll get it ready to go. And I will share out all of this information with everybody. So. Thank you so much um, for joining us on this Thursday evening. Um, thank you for all of your, your thoughtful questions and the discussion and have a good, a good rest of your evening. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Rebecca, Lisa, and Dan. Uh, Dan. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, for spearheading all of this. Thank <laughs> sure. you.